Okay, we uh, wait. Yeah, we are live. All right. So I'm over here with Jeff Marr. And yesterday we tried to do this live hangout and we did, and we had an excellent conversation, but it didn't uh, record. So we're going to do this again. So, Jeff, uh, good to have you on. Jeff has a channel. It's called Between the Lines. And what he does is he makes video summaries and he offers his insights and perspectives on different kinds of business books, uh, personal development books, things like that. And he includes animation. So these videos are very well put together. They're very um, engaging because of the animations and so forth. Jeff, it's good to have you on here. Thanks for having me, Joseph. So Jeff and I decided that we're going to have this conversation about Ryan Holiday's latest book. It was actually just released about eight to 10 days ago. It's called The Daily Stoic, 366 Meditations on Wisdom, Perseverance, and the Art of Living. So what we've done is we've gone through it, and uh, essentially this book is 366 days worth of reading and exercises and things like that, designed to integrate the philosophy of Stoicism in everything you do so that you could increase your success in no matter what area you choose. The power behind Stoicism is it gives the power back to you. It teaches you how to have control over the things you have control over and to not worry and let go of the things that you don't have control over so you can not only get the success you want, but you can make contributions to the world and you can be an example and so forth. So um, with the 366 different insights and exercises and things like that, uh, Jeff and I have gathered notes. So what we're doing is on this video right here, we're going to discuss uh, 10, 15 of them. It's going to be very free flow. We're going to share our insights and perspectives on this. And then on his channel, which the link is in the description, we're going to make a video uh, probably released like next week uh, in his format in which we're going to do an animated summary in which we're going to give our top insights and takeaways. So Jeff, you're excited to get started here? Absolutely. Okay. Let's start with Stoicism as a whole. What does Stoicism mean to you? Essentially, Stoicism is just a philosophy that people can use in real life, which means you're not learning Stoicism from a bunch of people who are in a in like holding up in caves and not experiencing life. Like the main people who are involved with Stoicism were Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, and Seneca. They're the main Stoic philosophers that everyone has read about, and they were at the high level, at a very high level in society. Like Marcus Aurelius, for example, was the most powerful man in the world during his time on this earth. So it's a, sort of a philosophy that can help you when you encounter hardships or when you feel your ego is starting to get into the way of, of things you do. And you've seen, we've seen throughout history, people's egos take them down and stoicism helps you keep that into perspective and just like, not focus so much on the results and how important it is to make you look good, but more so that you're just working because it's the right thing to do and you're not taking hardships personally and you're reframing things to kind of, when bad things do happen to you, you can reverse them so that they more so empower you and give you another obstacle to succeed. That's what Stoicism is for me. So one of the important distinctions that you mentioned is that this a philosophy is one that was utilized by high level people in society at those times. And one of the interesting things is things that I found is that the higher the level of person and caliber of person that you deal with, the more likely they are integrating either consciously or unconsciously the philosophies that you find within stoicism. And uh, this gives them an enormous amount of self-control, self-confidence, and they become the cause rather than the effect. And if you want to rise up to high levels and no matter what area of your choice, you're going to want to see yourself as the cause and you want to be able to control the dynamics that you have control over. And you want to be able to not see yourself as a victim or an effect in the world. So let's go ahead and get started here. I've gathered 56 something points here from the book. What we're going to do is I'm going to throw a handful of them out there to you, Jeff, and then I want your insights and perspectives on that, and I'm going to add to it. But once in a while, I might throw in a curveball, and I might ask you to to take one of my insights and apply it to a very specific area of life. Does that work for you? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay. Number one, different between what you can change and what you can't. 
Now this would be sort of like the serenity prayer, where it's uh, the power to change the things you can, the power to accept what you can't change, and the wisdom to know the difference. So you're not, you have a certain amount of things that you can control in your life. And that is something you should be very aware of, and you should be making, like doing your best if you want to change those things, you should be changing them. But there's also a large amount of things in this world that you can't change. And it doesn't really do you or anyone else any good to just sit there worrying about it. Like, if you ever get like some kind of string of bad luck and someone comes up to you and they're like, there was, there's starving kids in Africa, so it's not that bad. Like, there's not really anything I can personally do about that. So I'm not worried about those people. I'm worried about like my problems and what I what can I do to change what I can. And I'm not going to focus on things that I can't have any impact over. And there's an important distinction to be made about this. It's not that you don't care as in the issues of the world don't matter to you and they don't impact you, but rather you are focusing on what you have control over and as a collective, if everybody focuses on what they have control over, they will move the world forward. And you're not worrying about, you're not deluding yourself to try to put energy and awareness on something that you don't have control over to avoid doing the work. Absolutely. So next, let's talk about be ruthless to the things that don't matter. Again, this is, um, we can get, like you said, with uh, how we focus on things that we don't have like that big of a control over and you're letting that distract you from the things that you can control, you have to be ruthless to cut those things out so you're avoiding distractions. And a lot of things that also don't matter is people's opinion on you. Like you can't really control that. Everyone has an objective or a subjective view of how reality is, how the world looks. So their opinions on you, even if you're doing everything right, it's still someone's going to think badly about you. So you've got to let go of what others are thinking about you. You've got to let go of emotions that don't help you. You have to like ruthlessly cut these things out because you have somewhere that you need to be. And if you focus on all these little things that can distract you, you may not notice it in the moment, but you will notice that you make less and less progress the more you let these take over your life, essentially. So you've got to cut those out. And, and by ruthless, we're not talking about being abrasive with people or things we're talking about gracefully letting them go gracefully pivoting into a different direction the art is gracefulness because when you have confidence and you understand what your grand strategy is and you know what you need to get there what you need to do to get there who you need to associate with to get there you have to understand that it's about the grand strategy so when you come across things, situations, emotions, uh, ideologies that no longer serve you, that don't matter and don't, don't move the grand strategy forward, you have to learn how to gracefully let go of it. And when it comes to dealing with people, grace is very important because you don't want to stir up unnecessary resentment and anger um, because sometimes what happens is you need to move forward towards your objective and you just need to you know, not spend as much time with a person, but then later on you might connect with them again. But you want to make you want to also understand the dynamics in play and long term thinking and understand that that person also is doing stuff and they're contributing and so forth. So if you enable them and you motivate them to do their thing while you do your thing, then the overall objective and strategy moves forward. Does that make sense, Jeff? Absolutely. OK, so next, clarify your intentions. What does that mean to you? For that one, it just means you got to have a goal. You got to have something that you are heading towards, so you're you can let go of the um, if it happens or not. But like when you act, you need to have a purpose for acting. You can't be sidestepping things and like trying uh, like what we were saying with the ruthless thing. You can't mm -hmm. just be sidestepping people you have to like let them know you have to be able to communicate like hey this is what i'm doing right now lightly tell them like hey like you're not going to fit into this situation for the time being but you can't be you can't be passive and you have to you have to have a goal in mind for that so a couple things that come to mind um dealing with people because a lot of these aspects involve dealing with people clarifying your intentions means that 
you can be as clear as possible with people so you think but the meaning of the communication is the response you get and you might find that could they will violate your boundaries every now and then and then when the boundaries have been violated you have to take a step back and not react emotionally but engage in a dialogue with them have a conversation with them and if they're not able to have that conversation with you then you need to ask yourself if that is the right person to be working with or dealing with or so forth and um you know then you might have to take the route of what we uh, mentioned earlier and uh, ruthlessly uh evaluate your time and say that this is not the, the right person that I need to deal with. But as many times as possible, or as many situations when involves dealing with people as possible, keep your intentions clear. Now, however, there are people that have self-esteem issues or internal issues. And if you get very clear and direct with them, they, uh, they push back, they, they jump back. There is an art for dealing with them. And one of my favorite quotes, from the art of seduction is let the thoughts you are provoking come to them as if they were their own. And what this means is there are other ways of clarifying your intentions. And one of the ways is storytelling or metaphors. What do you have to say about that, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, we very like throughout history, we've evolved to more so attach with storytelling. We are we don't really deal too well with facts and figures so you can't be you have to remember you're not speaking to a robot when you're when you're talking to other people and the way to get to the root of someone like helping them understand is to use metaphors stories react to like be able to sense how they're feeling and then kind of change your approach based on that so it's like a kind of a dance that you're doing with another person versus you're not helping me out i'm going to catch you goodbye so you have mm -hmm. to have more grace to it than that. So it is absolutely like there's definitely an art to communicating with people and letting them know your feelings and then also sharing with stories and different examples that you can use to help them better understand and be so that they can remain on your team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the key to this is self-responsibility. You take responsibility for the person that you're communicating with 100% of the time. That's the frame that you come from. And you're constantly observing to see how they respond to what you're saying, how you're saying, um, through the obvious signs that they give out and the words that they say, but even the subtle gestures. And then from that, you're able to take a step back and recalibrate and uh, represent or recommunicate in a way that creates that behavioral change or the thought that you're facilitating. And that's, how you got to be with some people other people you could be very direct and say point form this is how it is so let's switch it up a little bit let's talk about circle of control actually it's not really switching it up because it's very related what does that mean for you circle of control again that's just there's certain things that you have your control over and that is mostly going to be things internal you have control over what you're going to aim for you have control over what your emotions are you have control over the amount of effort that you put in. You don't really have control over how something will turn out. To a degree you do, but again, that involves how much you're gonna work towards it. You don't have control over what others are gonna think about you because even though you could be doing something that completely within your moral boundaries fits and there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, other people just have different views on things. So that's not in your control. It's not up to you to really worry about that. But again, like with and again, with the how things are going to work out, the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu text, states you have a right to your actions, but you don't have a right to the fruit of your actions. So when you do stuff, when you're working, you've got to do it from the place that this is sort of your duty. This is what you have control over. And then you have to just have faith that it'll work out. And even if it doesn't, you'll be okay regardless. It'll lead to something good or it'll lead to something that's right. When we start off on this journey for in life, earlier stages of life, or when we start in a new area and we try to achieve mastery in the area, our circle of control is quite small. We don't have a lot of understanding of ourselves, the dynamics at play, how to deal with people in those scenarios. And as we become very self-aware and we observe the response we get from the stimulus we put out and we educate ourselves and we take action, 
our circle of control actually gets bigger. And a very specific example is communicating with others. I agree that you can't, for the most part, uh, control people. But however, one thing you can do is persuade, influence, motivate, inspire people. And there's a lot of nuance to that. And what you'll find is that during your journey in the earlier stages, it's hard to persuade people because you haven't learned the many dynamics in play. I would love to summarize it in you know a handful of videos, but there's a lot of nuance when it comes to communication and you learn with experience and presence and taking notes and studying deep reflective study. The better you get at it, the more likely you are able to persuade somebody that you wouldn't be able to persuade before because you understand the difference and the very nuanced segmentation between persuasion and manipulation. Whenever, whenever somebody tries or whenever somebody thinks you're trying to control them, they'll automatically step back. But when somebody seems or feels like you're on their side and even more so that you are them, they are you, then they're more likely to listen. So there's a lot of subtlety here. And um, one, of, one of the things I want to add to the circle of control is that it expands. However, the key to stoicism is to put more attention and awareness and not be disheartened by what you don't have control over right now. Your circle of control will improve, it'll get bigger, and then you will have that control. So cut the strings that pull your mind. What does that mean? What does this one mean? This one could be, we just have a lot of distractions. We have a lot of things that are vying for our attention. And right now, when you turn on the TV, every time you're gonna see a lot of commercials pulling your head in this direction and that direction. You need this, you need this. Like if you aren't happy right now, if you buy this, you will be. And it's all just kind of a waste of time and it's a waste of energy. So if you cut that, you'll be able to, like, if you know what you want and what you need to focus on, you just have to cut everything and this like, head straight in the direction that you're going. You can't just be going for something and then you see some something shiny over here and you go for that. So you, you have a goal, you have a vision, you can't just cut it off and go follow something else just because it might have more hold to you at that time. Like you, you need to commit to something and not let yourself get distracted by other things. So in today's world, there's a, a couple of important aspects when it comes to uh, the strings that pull your mind. Nowadays, because you got a lot of really smart people in advertising, working with technology, and they've got all kinds of things, because I invest a lot of time in the uh, advertising space, online advertising space, a lot of sophisticated ways to get you to go down the direction that they want you to go for a profitable end result for them and, and you too, hopefully. But the bottom line is that there's a lot of research and tools and things been put in place right now to get you out of what you're doing right now, your focus, and into a different direction. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you have to become is highly self-aware. You have to pay attention to the things that got you distracted. And then you have to systematically put things in place to remove that distraction. And as the world evolves, there's going to be more and more and more of these distracting things, and they're going to get even more complicated and more nuanced and very creative because it's like cat and mouse. I mean, you got people trying to get your attention, and you're trying to not have them have your attention. I mean, this is the game. You know, you got to love it. Number one is you got to love it. You can't be upset and bitter about it. You got to say, this is how it works. Now, I'm going to take action, and I'm going to be aware of the things that pull my strings before they pull my strings. And when if you found yourself in a situation where you got distracted or you're off course, uh, don't be disheartened and bitter about it. Reverse engineer to see how you got there to that place where you had gone and you were led astray and put something in place to uh, remediate that. Now, the interesting thing about this is because we live in a collective consciousness where being distracted is okay, being present is not the norm. When was the last time, Jeff? I mean, I have conversations with people every day in public. That's what I like to do. I do events and I have communications sessions, uh, group sessions, and so forth. Majority of people, 
98, 99% of them are not present in listening to what you have to say. Number one. Number two, they're not aware of the nuances. And, you know, this is variable, but they're not really making an effort. Their mind is bouncing onto something else. They're not really thinking about what they should be thinking about. They're thinking about who else they should talk to. They're not maintaining strong eye contact and uh, things like that. That's just the norm. So we live in this collective consciousness where that's considered the norm. So it's even harder for us to overcome that, but we must overcome it. We must be the minority that overcomes it, that number one, helps us move towards our goal, but also we can be the example for others that we are responsible for. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll see so many times, you'll just be talking to someone and even if they're not physically doing anything, you can kind of see them feeling for their phone, like, oh, did it vibrate? They're, not, they're like not in the exact reality that you guys are sharing together. They're not, they're not there to talk with you exactly and like that's all that they're focused on. They do still have their mind on other things and it's become a lot more socially acceptable to if you get a text message while talking or even if you don't, you're allowed to, you're able, like some people will scroll on Facebook and check their Facebook while they're talking to you or they'll see what other people are up to while they're talking to you and then people seem to think that this can like you're still paying attention but you're not we are not smart enough yet that we can multitask and have a bunch of conversations going on our phones while also being able to have a conversation with the person in front of them and it's just going to get more and more common that people are trying to multitask but what I've found and what a lot of people have found lately is that if you can just focus in on one thing that's kind of the only way you're going to be successful at this point because we have so much distraction, so many things pulling us in every direction. And if you can just focus down and learn stuff and pay attention, you'll probably be quite successful just because no one can even do that anymore. So I'm going to switch it up a little bit. I'm going to start with the next point and then I want you to add to it and, uh, and give me your uh, perspectives on it. Okay. So see the world like a poet, or an artist. And what this means to me is that we don't have to take life so seriously, right? This is a game. This is a simulation. This mm -hmm. is a theatrical experience. And our goal or our, our way of being, ideally one that brings us great joy and happiness, should be to uh, navigate this world like it was this story. Uh, a long story full of ups and downs and full of emotions and so forth. This way, I find that we're not going to be too uh, uh, overly thrown off by negative situations. And we see it as part of a story. Like when you watch a movie, for example, there's ups and downs to the movie. It's part of it. If you have lows, then you can enjoy the highs and so forth. And then when it comes to dealing with people, you can be a lot more engaging. Because okay? what I talk about is, is communication. If you're always rational and logical with people, it's not exciting. Okay, everybody's doing small talk every day when they're connecting with each other. That's not exciting. What are ways that you could uh, do? What are ways that you can communicate in a way where it's theatrical, it's artful, it's enjoyable, it's playful, it steers up emotions? Many different ways that you could do it. However, the uh, premise behind this is to treat life like it is this story and that you are this artist that is going out and painting the story not only for yourself, but others. Yeah, and one of the ways you can uh, do this is just there's no rule that says when someone asks you a question, you have to answer that question properly. Like if you appeal to the emotion versus logic you're gonna have a lot more fun interactions with others so like going back to what you were talking about with painting like a picture with storytelling and what we we're talking about with metaphors everything like that that's what can make what you're saying engaging it's not gonna be boring it's gonna be exciting because you can pretty much amuse yourself by making up a story and then the other person whoever you're communicating with they can also kind of jump in on this story and you guys can both add to that together and then you can build something together versus just how are you, what do you do, what's the weather like, where did you go to school, like boring stuff like that that's just straightforward logic based questions. If you can appeal to emotion and just make something fun and actually treat it like it's a game, which 
I mean, there is no real outcome. Like, it's not that serious, so it is a game. If you can do that, you're going to be able to paint pictures. You're going to be able to have better communication with others versus just that small talk that no one actually likes. So one of the things that I've gotten really good at nowadays, which I never really um, put any emphasis of, I never really realized, was that when I'm conversing some, with someone, I'm really f- uh, focusing on the vibe and the energy of the interaction rather than the words being used or the logical direction of the communication. And if you focus on the vibe and energy, then you're essentially being present to see if the vibe is going up, you're uplifting the person, or if they're down uh, grading the vibe and then you're uplifting it up. You're doing this kind of dance with the vibe and the words are just, they're just like little things that you throw out there to facilitate the vibe, which comes from, you know, the body language. Because most communication is sub-communication, body language, insinuation, uh, uh, tonality of your voice, etc. But when you, when you focus on the vibe of the connection, the vibe of the conversation, you're more likely to uh, treat the world like you were a poet and an artist and the words don't have a lot of weight. Now, you know, because in, in business, for example, a lot of people like come up to me and say, what do you say in a situation like this? And I can't give them a, a full straight answer. The reason why I can't give them a straight answer is because I don't know the vibe of the situation. I don't have the background of the situation. And the answer depends. One of my favorite sayings from the 33 Strategies of War or quote is finger spitzen gefühl, which means it's a German military term that means fingertip feel. And that is that all the best strategists that ever existed don't really have a clear-cut strategy before. Even though I talk about having a clear-cut strategy, I'm saying have a clear-cut strategy, but let go of that clear-cut strategy when you go into the present. When you go into the present, uh, and and, these strategists would go into the battlefield in the present, they would deploy or they would create or they customize the strategy based on the dynamics at play. It It was very, very dynamic and in the moment. And that's the same thing in business and sales. When you're connecting with someone, a lot of it has to do with energy, right? Absolutely. Okay. Sorry, go on. So there's also like that's something that you can't get by reading a book. That's something that has to come through experience. And what I, my background is in uh, for fitness things is in boxing. So what I do when I'm boxing is I never ever have like a grand strategy for how to beat a certain opponent. And it's always just based on just get a lot of rounds in and you can kind of feel what to do next in the next situation. And it is painful at first because you don't have like a a blueprint to fall back on, but you can through repetition, you can learn kind of where to put your energy, where to, where to block, where to punch. And the same happens in sales calls, interactions with others, just any social kind of situation. You need to get that through experience. You can't read it in a book because we're all, Again, we're all human beings. We're supposed to interact with each other. And if you stay inside all day, you're in an office cubicle. And same with even if you're doing all logic-based things, like you're doing your accounting all day, and then when you're in the office, you're only speaking logically to all of your coworkers and your boss and everything, then you're not going to really get too much experience. You have to practice with that little dance. You have to practice feeling the vibe and energy of interactions. Yes, and you know you're getting good at it when you're flowing with the vibe. Stephen Kotler wrote a, go- a great book, which I'm going to do a book summary on or insights and perspectives, The Rise of Superman. He talks about flow state, getting yourself in a certain state of mind where challenge meets skill. And essentially, it's a highly engaged, highly aware, highly present, but yet very relaxed state of mind. And when you're in that state of mind, uh, you, you just roll, you just flow. And I find myself getting like that when I teach the speed reading workshops. For example, in the first five minutes, I'm very in my head. I'm very stifled. I'm actually probably like that, and and I'm aware of that in this video when I started because I was working earlier. I was at the gym, highly focused stuff. And then, you know, as you start to let go of trying to hold on to the energy or trying to be correct or try to use the right words, you actually flow your personality outwards. You actually um, release those barriers, those fears, those insecurities, and you flow more. And then you start connecting at the energetic level and you start to flow in the energetic level. And when you're communicating with people and you're in that energetic level, if people are logical and they see that, they won't understand what's actually happening. 
but you will and the other person will because you're playing with the energy and you'll have be having a good time and you'll be laughing and you'll be moving forward towards the objective however it'll be done in a very playful way and uh, you know that's a very important distinction so i want to because uh, we, we got into, I didn't actually think we were going to get this far into the energy discussion, but I think it's valid because uh, when I make more of these videos, especially right now that I'm making Way of the Superior Man, uh, we're talking about masculine and feminine energy and polarities. It's important to understand that if you really want a high level of mastery, you have to become tuned in to the energies and you have to work with the energies and what you say and how you look and um, all these surface level things don't really have a lot of meaning. They're enough to get you started. In lower stages, they matter, but in higher levels, they don't matter as much. So let's uh, talk about two kind of, it, in, in a way, they might seem like contradictory, but they're not. But we'll start with one and then we'll switch the other. Number one, push for deep understanding. What does that mean to you? That means if you have an opinion on something, you can't just go by what the news is going to tell you or what some basic level thing is going to tell you. You can't just listen to one person's opinion and then take that as your own. So you need to be questioning when someone tells you something, question, is this valid? Like, And then go look, do some more research, figure things out. And if you have, say you have a, an opinion on something, you need to be able to look at the opposing opinion and learn that opinion just as well so that you you have a fully educated opinion. You can't just Take something like this is correct and I'm going to stick with it and there's no convincing me otherwise. You need to be able to take in, without ego, just take in all information and be able to make a judgment from there after you have a deep understanding of it. You can't just take everything at face value and just, then you that's how you lose debates. If you have no understanding of something and you are dead set on your principles for it, then you're going to just lose with someone who has even like a basic deep level understanding. One of the, the powers is to be able to hold two polarizing thoughts in your mind through uh, two conflicting thoughts in your mind and be okay with it. Most people, when they try to uh, come up with a decision or live a, a life a certain way or communicate with someone they're trying to go either left or right in the conversation. They're essentially trying to get to a point where they want to conclude it's a certain way. And we fail to recognize that not everybody sees reality the same way we do. And if we're looking to build meaningful connections with people, if we're looking to progress forward uh, as a team and so forth in business, then we have to be embracing of somebody else's viewpoint, even if it doesn't agree with our own. So when you have a deep, deep, deep understanding, or you, I should say, let me step back. If you want to gain a deep understanding, then when you're communicating with somebody, try to see where they're right. Okay, even if they're communicating from a point of view that you don't agree with, try to continue that conversation and ask some very uh, deep reflective questions to see where they're right, because they could be right from their point of view and they most likely are. Now, if you do this, you're able to hold two polarizing thoughts in your mind. You're okay with having two energies that are conflicting in your mind at the same time. For example, in the way of the superior man, the masculine and feminine energies are two different polar opposite energies for the most part. But once you've made peace with having both of the aspects of masculine and feminine energy in your mind, then you can work with it better. If you're too one-sided, then you're always going to look at the other one as something that you can't understand. And what we can't understand or, uh, is, is, is something that we usually don't want to understand. And what's, what we don't want to understand, we usually uh, conclude from a delusional standpoint and put negativity on it, like that's the bad thing and we're the good thing. So... You know, that's one of my uh, areas for developing a deep understanding. Another thing that I do is I try to associate, like in business, for example, I try to work with businesses in many different industries, like all around different kinds of industries, online, offline, uh, logistics, uh, different kinds of companies, uh, internet businesses, uh, cafes, bars, restaurants, because a lot of them have different ways of doing things. And there are similarities and there are differences in the way they, they do business. 
And uh, by investing time in businesses that I don't have a deep understanding with, even though I have a deep understanding in one business, I'm actually able to get further, deeper knowledge and take that understanding and apply it to another business. This is one, things, one of the things I've learned from Jay Abraham. This is one of his big philosophies, take it from one industry and apply it to another industry. Okay, so that's a deeper understanding, push for deeper understanding. We should never strive or we should never conclude that we know what we're talking about. Even as adamant as I seem and as adamant as Jeff seems in this video, we're still just scratching the surface. We're still deepening our understanding on these subjects and so forth. Now, this might sound contradictory, this next point, but it's very related because we're talking about polarities here. Uh, keep it simple. Here, one, on one side, we're saying push for deep understanding. The other side, we're saying keep it simple. So uh, go ahead, Jeff. What, what, do you, what, what does that mean, keep it simple, in relation to having a deep understanding? There's, when you first start doing something, it seems pretty basic. And then when you get deeper into it, say at an intermediate level, it gets so complex and there's all these different moving parts and it's just like a very advanced thing. And then when you reach a master level, you can often find it goes back to being simple again. And there is a quote about this, I can't remember the exact way it goes, but the deeper your understanding of something, the simpler it, simpler it will be to sort of make decisions and just stick by those decisions an intuitive sense and a way of making your without having to question yourself if this is the right option or not. So in Malcolm Gladwell's book Blink, he talks about how pretty well people who make split second decisions are almost just as accurate in making them as people who sit there studying the logistics and studying all the facts and everything. They have probably a lesser way of success than if you're an expert on something. You just take a quick look at it and then you can make your decision based on that. So that's kind of keeping it keeping it simple, although you are still going deep on it. So a good example would be um, high-level executives, high-level business people, those that started essentially from the ground up and were able to build on their understanding by working in different realms of business at a ground level. And then as they rose up to higher levels, they're able to speak very simply, they're able to communicate using simple communications. But however, those simple communications are built on the foundation of very granular understanding. So what I mean by that is someone who has a deep understanding of a subject might say very simple statements, but then when you ask them to elaborate on what they meant by that, they're able to break it down, break it down, break it down. And when they're communicating with different people in different levels of business, they're able to speak to the level of abstraction that they understand. For example, when you go to um, a grocery store, let's, just, let's use McDonald's because that's a good example. At a very granular level, you've got making the fast food. Okay, that's a very granular level. At a very high level, you're looking at maybe mergers and acquisitions of other businesses. But all those parts in between from the very ground level and the high level determine the decision that's going to be made for the business. And if somebody doesn't have a good level of understanding of the granularities or a proper reporting structure from their team to give them the insightful data on some of the granularities, their decisions are not going to be as accurate. So very simple decisions sometimes that are made by executives are met with a lot of resistance. And a lot of times the resistance is because people don't take the, understand, uh, take the time to understand all the complexities involved with a simple decision. Another example is in business. Um, let's say somebody puts a deal together and they make $300,000. They get fronted $300,000. Someone might look at that and say, whoa, you know, all he did was have this conversation with this person and he got a $300,000 check. What they're failing to see is all the nuances of that communication, all the positioning, all the, the, the different aspects, I'm not gonna get into it in wide detail, that that person had acquired either through experiences or through understanding of the person that they're dealing with or their ability to, to ask the right questions and uh, keep the conversation in a certain uh, framework during that deal to be able to facilitate that outcome. And that in itself is, is very complicated 
but it's yet also very simple. So those are my insights on that. And uh, to add on that, I actually just had a meeting earlier with someone, and he was talking about this is like a story, which I've heard before. I'm going to butcher it right now. But essentially, it was like they this ship has a boat, or this ship has a captain and the, the motor, the fan isn't working, the engine. And so they call a bunch of experts in, they just can't really do anything about it. And then they call one guy in, he, he sits there, looks at it for a little bit, then he takes out a hammer and he just taps it three times in this specific spot, and then the motor starts working again. And then he writes them a check for $10,000. And they're like, well, this took 20 minutes for you to do, like how is this $10,000? But he, it's, didn't take him 20 minutes for him to do it. It was like an entire lifetime that built up to his complex understanding on just making the simple little fix that no one else could figure out, no matter how long it took them to do it. So threefold here. Earlier we're talking about holding two polarizing thoughts. One is deep understanding, granular understanding, and the other is simple, keeping it simple. They're both polarizing thoughts, yet you need to do both. People that do really well have the ability to do both. Some people try to bypass it and make simple decisions, yet they don't have a deep understanding. Or some people are very deep in certain understandings and they think they could uh, explain it in a simple format, but because they don't understand how many other things work, especially communication with the other person, they're not able to simplify it. So let's move on. Steady your impulses. For this one is just we are creatures of habit. There's certain things we've been doing for a very long time and it's kind of on autopilot. Most of the things that we do day to day is just gonna be autopilot. We're not thinking about it. So if you want if you have a goal that you want to get to, if you have things you need to do, you gotta understand that you have impulses that are not helping you. And that would be for me, say I have a bunch of emails that I need to answer or job proposals I need to send out, I'll find myself just on Facebook or I'll find myself doing something that's not productive and that's just an impulse. Like I don't think about it, it just happens and even though it only takes a couple seconds and then I, I realize back that I've been distracted, it still takes a lot longer to get back into that flow of work again. So you have to be able to understand where you are doing things unconsciously that are gonna hurt you and you need to be able to stop doing those and at least, you're never gonna get it perfect, but you have to be able to at least like get it better and better by like 0.01% every day if you can and just keep working at it, keep chipping away and just trying to make yourself a little bit better at not, not getting angry when you would normally get angry or not getting distracted where you normally get distracted and then see if you can string together a bunch of days where you don't get distracted or you don't get angry when someone Say someone's yelling at you, if you can keep your calm, this is very stoic. It's you're keeping your calm, you're keeping cool and controlled, and you're not rising to anger. That's something that's difficult. It's very easy to just someone's yelling at me, I'm gonna yell back. If you can control those impulses, you're gonna find you're gonna be a lot happier with your life and you're gonna get a lot more done. There's a quote from the 33 Strategies of War. It's a simple quote, yet it goes very deep. And it is, amidst the turmoil of events, do not lose your presence of mind. The quote essentially means uh, maintain a balance. The ability to develop that balance requires a lot of battle testing, a lot of training, a lot of experience. And then once you've got that, you're able to maintain the presence of mind. But that should be one of the goals. And very related to that is our next point, and I want your opinion on what I said about the 33 strategies of war quote amidst the turmoil events, not lose your presence of mind, and in the relation to what you're talking about of not letting anger throw you off and also relate it back to this quote here, which is, circumstances have no care for our feelings. That it doesn't matter what your plans are, what is going to hurt you, things are going to happen in your life. They're not always going to be good. And it's just a fact of life. You can't get yourself pulled into victim mentality of it. And you need to be able to control yourself. So you've got to stay, what you're saying was remain present in mind. You have to be able to stay with what's happening to you. You have to be able to look at something, even though it didn't happen. For example, 
yesterday we recorded this video and then it didn't record so now we're redoing it today there's no point in us getting upset about it not recording yesterday we just we have a new goal and it's to redo it we like, getting angry about it getting upset about it it won't do anything for the final video it's gone we might as well you just have to be able to accept it really quickly come up with a new game plan game plan right away and then execute on that game plan you know and that's the the truth for many areas of our lives business relationships dating friendships you can go out there and put out your best and do your best and the other person might not reciprocate and that's okay you come back with objective data you make your optimizations and you go forward in relation to not having the video recorded yesterday right away we got on like I remember when I told Jeff I said it didn't record all we did was we booked the time for the next day. We just said, let's book it tomorrow, and away we go. This time, however, we got redundancy. Jeff's recording it. If this doesn't work and doesn't save, then you're not going to get the live version of this uh, posted on, the, on my uh, channel, but you're going to get Jeff's video. We're going to chop it up and put it on the channel, so you'll still have it. So we got redundancy. And again, those are circumstances, and those circumstances don't care about our feelings. I think what happens is that in early stages of our lives because our parents and our elders care about our feelings and our feelings are, you know we cry about something and then we get our way we kind of create this patterning that says that if we have strong feelings the external world is going to care while that's true and sometimes you're around really good people and they'll genuinely care in high levels of success or mastery in certain levels the competition let's not get it twisted, is pretty ruthless. And um, that can be a good thing, not a bad thing. Okay, It can be a good thing if you understand that we're looking at circumstances here. Okay, You need to be able to process your feelings. And what I always say is go at it with an open heart because what happens is you'll be attacked and it'll hurt, but you can't close off because your heart helps you navigate the world, it gives you your passion, it gives you your purpose and so forth. So you leave it open and you move forward and then you eventually retrain yourself to look at the situation or the outcome or the response you get as uh, something that will give you optimizations to recalibrate and move you forward. Now here's the interesting thing about life is it's always going to hit you where it hurts, always. And the reason why it hits you where it hurts is because when it hits you, when it doesn't hurt, you don't even notice it. That's because you've overcome that. So whenever you get something that hits you and throws you off, I don't want you to ignore it. I want you to actually feel it all the way through. I want you to keep, uh, be present and feel the pain of it. Okay, like enjoy the pain of it. And this is something that I've been doing. And what it does is it builds up your self-esteem. It builds up your self-confidence. And in certain situations, it can be harder than others. But there's many situations in our lives right now that, we, if we just adopt this philosophy, what I'm talking about right now, you'll be able to overcome it in like a day, okay? And if that situation was to happen to you again, whatever it is that hurt you, that hurt your feelings, you'll be better equipped to overcome it or it wouldn't even cross your awareness and you'd be able to pivot really quick on that. Do you have anything to say about that, Jeff? Yeah, usually when things come up and they sort of block your path, you can, by choosing to reframe everything as an obstacle for you to get even better than you were going to be. Like if everything just went perfect all the way through, you wouldn't have a chance to really learn too many lessons. So you get to pivot and make changes in real time and then you get to adapt to situation, which makes you just a more, com like a more complete person if you can take things that are thrown at you and just use them to make something better. Like who can really stop you? So if you reframe everything as like, Anything bad that happens to you is sort of a blessing in that it's giving you a chance to increase your abilities and it's giving you a chance to develop new tools that you can use for other problems in the future. Then you'll find that say something upsets you for, like Joseph was saying, like a day or say you have a rough breakup and it messes with you for a couple months. If you can overcome that, the next breakup you have, it'll be faster. It'll, you'll get over it like in half the time and then the next one in half the time from that until it gets to the point where you're so complete with like figuring out your emotions and like coming up with game plans that like things don't really phase you 
and you can just take whatever life hands you and you can just build something amazing with it. And that'll, that's like a very important life skill. You develop this by internal discipline and toughness. And you do that by putting yourself in as many situations that are controlled chaos, again, from 33 Strategies of War, where you're going to get hurt. And the objective is to feel the pain in those situations and then overcome and then pivot and then shorten the span of how long it takes you to overcome and pivot. And Jeff mentioned an interesting point, real time, real time, being able to get hurt real time, absorb the pain uh, in a certain way and then overcome, feel it through and then pivot right away. It doesn't have to take days or weeks. Like for example, relationship breakups, contrary to the belief that a relationship breakup should take time to heal, it's really just based on the individual and their ability to heal. Okay, there's a difference between being delusional and ignoring and healing. Healing, we can shorten the span. And you shorten the span of healing by proactively putting yourself in situations in many areas of your life where you develop your ability to heal faster. Next, awareness is freedom. And we're going to go through a handful more before we end this video. I think we've covered a lot. Uh, there's 366 of these in the book, and I'm just pulling up very high-level quotes. In the book, there's exercises, so I recommend you get this book. And this can be a, a year-long journey for you if you read it every day and you do the exercises to further instill the philosophies of Stoicism for whatever your objective is and to help you get deeper levels of realizations that are personal to you so you can compound those effects. So uh, awareness is freedom, Jeff. What you are paying attention to is what's happening, what's in the present moment is where your life is taking place. Like if you're constantly worrying about the future, if you're always thinking about what happened to you in the past, you're not really going to be like you're contained. You're in a jail of your own creation. Whereas right now we could just be sitting here worrying about what we have to do after this call or what I did earlier today. But just by us being in this present moment, we're able to really enjoy this process of making this video and it's more enjoyable with us being aware and having fun in the moment and we're not stuck doing like stuck in the future what's going to happen tonight where's my next meal going to come from where am i going to sleep tonight what did i do that was embarrassing a couple weeks ago or on the weekend where can i learn from it if you are aware of what's happening right now you're free essentially you know, and this is not based on theoretical uh, ideas that Jeff and I have. This is based on, uh, Jeff and I have many conversations about this. We live this philosophy, and it's a philosophy that we try to instill further, deeper every single day. And the, uh, a few weeks ago, I got invited to a very, um, a very uh, exclusive event in Arizona, and I got the opportunity and privilege to have a conversation with John Mackey, who is the founder of Whole Foods. And he is one of the most present people that I've ever met. And I was very fascinated. And also, um, it, re it helped me further internalize, internalize the realization that that's where it's at, the present moment. Here's somebody that's running an organization with tens of thousands of employees, a lot of different uh, nuances and pieces and dynamics and legalities and so forth, running uh, a, a chain like Whole Foods. Yet, when I was having a conversation with them, it felt like him and I were the only people in the room and that I was the most important person to him. He's an author of a book called Conscious Capitalism. I will probably do a book summary on that. I'm interested in reading it. But it was interesting to meet someone at such a high level and have a conversation with them. And then at that event, I actually met a few high-level people. Um, you know, Dave Asprey, the founder of uh, Bulletproof Coffee, Damon John, the founder of FUBU, and now with his new book, The Power of Broke, and universally, they were present. Universally, you know, you've got these people that are responsible for massive organizations, and they have a lot of things to do, and their schedules are booked to the T. And even prior to that, uh, um, a couple of months ago, I met Harvey McKay and Michael Gerber, right? And again, high-level people, big-time authors, bestsellers, but very present. Now, it was the ones that, 
are actually, um, you know, they were coming up. They had a certain level of success, and some of them were even New York Times bestsellers that were not very present with their energy and bouncy that people took note of that at the event. And there was people talking about them, and they were saying, you know, there's these people, they're coming up, but I think they're coming up too fast, and they're going to hit uh, something that's going to throw them off to bring them back to earth. So when you look in, in, in comparison, you see high-level people who are very present. You could tell that not only do they have more capacity to rise themselves up, but they are very present to all the nuances. And they're, how, they, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And it is that reason why they're at that high level. And if somebody rises up and they are not present anymore through the rise up, then you best believe that life's going to throw something at them a curveball, which is going to hit them in a weak area, and they're not going to see it because they're not present. And you have to think, too, with those guys, it's almost like mandatory that they have to develop that present awareness because think about the responsibility that is on the shoulders of these guys. Like If they were looking into the future and everything that's going on, they'd probably have like mental breakdowns. So like I'm sure they have like a couple times a week where they sit down and they strategize overarching like where they're trying to get to in the future. But if they let that affect them day to day, they won't be able to get anything done and they won't be able to move in a positive direction and it probably will crush them. So it's kind of like a forced skill that you need to have if you want to get to that level. Which brings me to my next point. If you want to learn, be humble. And it's not... It's easy to let your ego get in the way of you accomplishing things. If you think you're doing good, like if anyone here watches the UFC and saw what happened with Ronda Rousey when she, I think it was last year, she was on top of the world, the most popular women's mixed martial artist, potentially athlete on earth at the time. She looked unstoppable and she let that kind of get to her head. And then she just got knocked out and then it crushed her. It made her disappear for over a year. She wasn't able to compete. She's just coming back now, but she just sort of disappeared. And it was a lot of it is just your ego. And you have to understand that what happens to you in life, the universe is kind of, it's not going to just let it happen so that you're on top all the time. If you let things get to your head and if you think succeeding is your destiny, the universe is going to throw something at you to let you know that is not the case. So you have to stay humble about all of your victories, all of your defeats, everything that happens to you to stay humble with it. And then you won't get overwhelmed. You won't get destroyed and have this massive downfall that you don't need to have. But if you let your ego get in the way, it is going to have to happen. And the universe is not out to get you. The universe is actually on your side. The reason why you get, a bashing of your ego is to bring you back down into a nice place where you could rise up even higher because the ego doesn't help you rise up higher in the sense that if you think you're the greatest and you think you're the shit and all your stuff is better than other people and you look down upon people, you're not really being, you're not really living in reality, right? Because in reality, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with complexity. You have to be able to be present and aware of that complexity. And when you've got an inflated ego, you only see it from the certain lens of facade that you put on. And thus, the universe will help you remove that by bringing you down and uh, leveling you out. So, observe cause and effect. And actually, before we get into that, I, I had a thought. Yesterday, you and I had this conversation about charisma in one of the points. And I want to bring that up again because I thought it was very valuable for everyone watching. Uh, including myself, and it's worth meditating upon. Uh, so you read this book called, uh, what was it, The Charisma Myth? Yep, by Olivia Fox Cabane. What were the three components that make up charisma? You mentioned to me yesterday. So the charisma is made up of strength, or sorry, power, warmth, and presence. So power is like your authority, how much when you say something, people are going to listen to you. And she talks about a couple things for that are your ability to have breaking rapport tonality. So you're not always like, hey, how's it going? Like you're not trying to get people to like you. When you talk in breaking rapport tonality, it's sort of, it comes off as sort of a challenge when you're talking to other people. But 
they're not mm-hmm. you're not offending anyone when you say it but when you talk in breaking rapport it conveys power and when you are conveying warmth charisma that would be sort of like mother teresa would be a, a warm character and she so like everyone with charisma they have all three of these things but certain t- certain styles of charisma have certain different levels of each of these and to convey warmth you'd want to go say like look into someone's eyes and just really pay attention to what their problems are what's going on in their life what may hurt them and what they're going through and then that'll give you warmth and it'll allow you to sort of feel love for what they're feeling and that'll make them feel understood and when they feel understood they're gonna be drawn towards you and then presence which is what we've been talking talking about that's something that just kind of holds both of them together. Like no matter what you want to do, as long as you're present to the moment, um, you're gonna be charismatic. You're gonna make people feel like they're important. Like we were talking about with those high level guys earlier. If you are just present to the moment, people feel that you and them are the only person in the room, and there's like kind of like a bubble where you guys can sort of be yourselves and converse like that. And one of the tools that uh, the author gives you in that book is to just feel the sensations in your toes when you feel yourself sort of fading out of like a conversation. So that would be when you're when you feel what's going on in your toes, it sends your brain sends like a signal through your body. It tells you that everything's okay, your body is fine, and then you can be back in the present moment. It's kind of like doing a, a little rain check to see everything's all good. Yes, now I can pay attention again, and that sort of fades out. Um, continually and something you have to work on every single day like many different skills but once you get that you'll be a more charismatic individual okay I'm bringing this up for a couple of reasons number one is because uh, I cover communication and persuasion on my channel that's the premise of everything that I I stand for because to me it's the most important skill your ability to persuade someone in an ethical way to win-win outcome is a uh, a valuable skill, not only for yourself, but the person that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, So I wanted to talk about that. And number two is I want to relate it back to our last three points that we're going to connect with. So we're going to keep connecting back into it. Uh, But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, 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 the triangle, you can say those those three aspects. And I want to share my insights on it. So power is, something that is very masculine energy okay it is presented through a powerful gaze firmness in what you believe in direction goals moving forward energy that is uh, assertive not aggressive but assertive the uh, warmth is a very feminine aspect it's about being now in the moment and uh, comfortable with it not just now in the moment but comfortable with it and so when you combine the two, you've got a powerful presence, but it's also one that is accepting. It's a combination. If you go too far on the side of power, you will come off as controlling. If you go too far on the side of warmth, you will come off as not having a direction. So someone who's charismatic has a powerful gaze and they speak with projection, but they're also very welcoming and accepting of who you are. And, you know, John Mackey comes to my mind when I had that conversation with him. He had those two. Uh, number three is presence. Presence being you are here in the moment and you're not thinking about where to take the interaction because you know the interaction is going to go where it should go. And so you're, you're enjoying the interaction. You realize you're having a conversation with a singular person so you're going to engage and stimulate them. And in, in exchange, it's going to stimulate you. You're going to maintain a strong, not overpower, but a strong enough energetically projecting gaze with your eyes. Again, the power aspect, it's going to be warm. Your energy is going to be warm, so you're going to be uh, more relaxed. And in order to be able to do all three of those things, and again, John Mackey comes to mind, is practice. And so it relates to the next two points, and then you could even say the third one. But let's cover the next two points and, and and kind of, if you can, Jeff, relate it to what I was just talking about right now and, and the charisma aspect. Uh, don't let your attention slide and observe cause and effect. Yeah, so for the don't let your attention slide, in terms of 
dealing with other people, this would be the presence aspect in terms of in the charisma. So when you're talking with someone like we are right now, if you can just stay present to this moment, we're, we're able to build something together by, I really like the style where it's like, we don't have anything planned out. We're just kind of sitting here talking with each other and we're just letting it kind of flow out. And I'm not distracted by what I got to do later. You're not distracted by what you have to do later. And we're just sort of letting this unfold the way it unfolds. There's no real game plan to it. And then that's how it's going to be more powerful. And that's why, that's by us staying in the present moment. We're not getting distracted by anything. And our attention has been here pretty well the entire time. So that's one way that that's important. And then for the cause and effect, what was that? What was that other quote? Observe cause and effect. Observe cause and effect. That one, a lot of people, they live their life as the effect of what happens to them. And that's where you will get the victim mentality. Like someone said this to me, this is how I feel about it. This happened to me earlier, this is how I feel about it. And then you're letting the cause of other things affect how you feel throughout the day. What you want to be is at the cause. And when you're at the cause, you're making things happen, you're pushing things in the direction that you want to want them to go, and you can observe the effect of you doing stuff, what it'll what it has on others. And then in real time, and this is, again will take practice upon practice and hours and hours. But when you say stuff, you can observe the effect that you're having on other people, and then you can adapt to how they're feeling, and then you can kind of mold the interaction so you guys both get a beneficial outcome from it. So this is why people don't really like salespeople. So sales is kind of a grimy, grimy profession where people are like, oh, like they don't care about me at all because it's just to them. You're, they just got to hawk their product onto you. They need to make some sales. They need to sell this. They don't care about you. They don't care if you even need what you're selling. I was at a, a mall a couple months ago and some guy was trying to sell me like hand lotion. He's like, look at how good this is. Like, I don't, I'm not his target demographic. He doesn't, he's not ever going to sell anything to me. And it was just kind of, it was just slimy, greasy. And he wasn't paying attention to what did I need? What did I want to get out of the, out of our interaction? And all he was focused on was himself. He wasn't focusing on the effect that he was having on another person. And then that's how he lost himself to sale. And that's what the, why you need to observe the effect you're having on others. So you can be a proper cause versus a negative one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's very that's good, good relation. So I'm going to add some, a little bit of echo. Can you mute your microphone for a second? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, cause and effect, don't let your attention slide, related back to the triangle of uh, power, warmth, and presence. Okay. We need to make sure that when we're interacting with people, we are as aware as possible of the responses we get from them at an obvious level as well as a nuanced level because the meaning of the communication is the response you get. And when you're projecting energy from a place of power, warmth, and you're being present to that and you're allowing that to flow through you, the other person will receive that and you know you're in a good place when they're open and accepting of that energy that you're giving to them. From that, in sales, it's about moving the objective forward towards the goal. So you'll have communications with them, you'll explain things with them, and you'll make an offer. By making the offer, you're essentially waiting for the effect after making the offer from the other person. If the effect is not desirable, if it's not the one, when I say desirable, it's not desirable for both parties or not desirable for one party, but desirable for the other, then you need to go back and make sure that you're maintaining that triangle of power, warmth, and presence and come back to them and say, let's figure this out. Let's figure out how we can make this work for both of us. And people rarely get that. Okay, in sales, people rarely get that. And when they get that, they're more likely to be persuaded to listen to what you have to say and take you on your counter offer. That's because in the communication of maintaining power, warmth, and presence, you are sub-communicating. You're sub-communicating 
that by them going with you they are safe that you will take good care of them and you have to do this with ethics and you can't do it uh, without being ethically because it's hard to communicate almost impossible to communicate that combination of power warmth and presence if you're being un uh, unethical if you're trying to take advantage of somebody you will display your lack of presence because we are inherently good as people and we don't like to take advantage of people we just do it because we're afraid and uh your fear will be projected so that's my stream of consciousness on that so jeff uh in a moment unmute yourself and i want to ask you on the final point and there's i took 56 of these i would love to have a discussion on all these points and uh I can't because then the video will go on for too long and so forth. So we're gonna we're gonna pick one more point here. And to me, this is the pinnacle point, the kind of premise of the entire discussion here, the premise of what I stand for on my channel, the premise of why I make these videos not only for everyone watching, but myself. And I want your uh insights and I want you to your stream of consciousness on this, Jeff. The mind is all yours. So with the mind being all yours, you don't really have control, again, what we were talking about with what is going to happen to you in your life, but you do have control over how you're going to respond to things. And whenever something bad happens to you, it's under your control on how you react, are going to react to it. It's not under your control how things are gonna work out, but you can always make your reaction to things positive and you can always kind of adapt figure out new things and we're born to solve problems you can use your mind to solve almost any problem that you that you encounter in your life and you'll find in stoicism a lot of it is just the same a couple principles over and over and over again it's just like work hard don't be too attached to the outcome of it do things for others, like be caring about other people, and then like, stay present to the moment, and don't be too upset about what happens to you, and it all involves your mind, and you having the self-control and self-discipline to do certain things that you know you need to do, and that is the only thing that's under your control. You can't control how others are going to really react to certain things, except through, like you were talking about, like persuasion, but you, when you are doing persuasion, Unless you're a sociopath, you do need to have that win-win mentality and what you're offering to someone else is going to be beneficial to them. And you're not trying to get one over on anyone because then you won't be able to maintain that charisma and that presence of state because you will be doing something against your fellow man. Yes, yes. Okay, so in summary, uh, it's stoicism is a philosophy that gives the power back to you to be able to interact with your environment based on what you want to achieve but also not only on what you want to achieve but also what is your contribution for the world and it does it it, it these philosophies are designed to remove the distraction emotional turbulence the unnecessary emotional turbulence and to make this life a exciting, poetic, and artful journey. And uh, I wanna thank you, Jeff, for taking the time to not only once, but twice, because we recorded yesterday, it didn't, it didn't go through. So uh, uh, invest the time to have this conversation and share your very valuable and revealing insights and, and perspectives. And it stimulated a lot of thoughts in my mind, and I'm sure it's stimulated a lot of thoughts in the minds of those that are watching this right now. And um, another uh, thing to add to that is you and I always have these kind of discussions and uh, it's important that whoever's watching this to not only read this book and internalize the philosophies, but act upon it and then surround yourself with people who stimulate this way of thinking because that's going to further uh, rewire the brain from a place of empowerment. So thank you, Jeff, for joining us. And um, well, I'm going to let you uh, say a, a handful of things before I talk about your channel because I want to talk about that too.
No, well, thank you again for having me on here. It's good to, I really enjoy having our conversations together. We've had them many times and I'm liking the fact that we can have them recorded so we can go back and see them because there is some high level stuff in here. And the book is good because it involves doing something every day. So it, there's a different part, different stoic principle that you can practice every day. And what we were talking about earlier with many things in our life, life is just going to be a matter of habit. The, the way this book is designed is so that when you are reading it, you do something, then it's done for the day, then you continuously do that every single day for a year. And what you're doing is you're building a nice habit, and that's going to be a good part of your morning routine if you have one, and you, you should probably be developing one. And that will be a good way to get your day started off on the right foot is – by taking one of these stoic lessons, applying it to your life, seeing where you're screwing it up, and then just kind of making changes here and there. And then also, yeah, you're gonna be, as you start thinking higher level and you start doing these things, you're gonna start attracting better and better people into your life and like who want more and more of the same things that you want. And it'll be, your life is just gonna get better and better the more you implement good habits and think about what you're doing, why you're doing it, and have presence to the moment when you're doing going about your day and going about your life. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for that insightful um, uh, stream of consciousness. So Jeff has a channel, and the channel is called Between the Lines. And what he does is he makes videos on books, personal development books, business books, and he does it with animations. So they're very engaging and they're short videos. Mine are lengthy. I get into lengthy discussions. His are insightful and high level, very good summaries with his own perspectives on it. That when you go and read a book and you go watch his videos or you watch the video prior to reading the book, you will, it'll stimulate more ideas and more action items and insights. And they're very engaging and they're very entertaining. So I recommend that you check out his channel. The link is going to be in the description. And if possible, I could embed the link in this video to the video that we are going to make on his channel together, which is going to be an animated summary on this book, then I will. And if not, uh, check out his channel in the link in the description. Watch his videos. Uh, what was that book that you did? I really enjoyed. Uh, what's that one? that I said I really like it and I commented and I can't remember the name of it, but the premise was essentially about focus. Deep Work by Cal Newport. That's right. So that was that's one of my uh, favorite videos on your channel, but I haven't gotten a chance to watch as many, so I know that they're all good and they're all high quality. So check that out. And on that note, thank you again, Jeff, and thank you everyone who's who have tuned in to watch this live. I'm actually planning on doing a lot more of these because I like this format. Okay, having somebody on here where we could have a conversation, a discussion, and a free flow insights and perspective. Somebody that's uh, making uh, videos on YouTube or guests that uh, I've been connecting with uh, outside of the YouTube world. And we have discussions on this because those of you that know me know that I pretty, pretty much spend most of my time <laughs> uh, studying and evaluating persuasion, communication, uh, not just from like this theoretical level, but actually in a level where I implement it for my clients in business and so forth. And, and that's what I really enjoy. So I'm, uh, if you like this format, leave a comment below. I'm going to do more of these live videos and we'll continue this. And I'll add this as part of my uh, video release process on top of the uh, regular books, insights and perspectives with mind maps that I do. So thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Jeff. And did I forget anything? Because this is free flow. I could have forgotten something. <laughs> Was there anything else that I forgot, Jeff? I think that's pretty good. Okay, good. Thank you, and we'll talk soon. Take care. All right, see you, Jesse.